www.google.com, you need to sign in with your staff account. And luckily I'm here, so if your password is bad, uh, doesn't work, I can reset it. So if you're signed in as, if you're signed in with your regular Gmail account, you need to sign out. Yeah, you need to sign out of that one. Actually, I, I. And I can, I can switch from both. I've been able to switch without signing out. Yeah. Yeah, I know there's a way to do that. So do you, you go up to the little icon. Um, you can just add another add account. Another account. Yeah, add another account. I just recommend signing out because, just like the union was saying, I don't know what the repercussions are of using your home. Is it the same? I guess if you're using your home on your work computer, that's not discoverable as it is using your school on your personal computer. Because right. this whole discoverability issue is what has members worried. So we have to be aware that if you use any home personal device to conduct school business, if ever there's a court case, they can take your personal devices to search through everything to find anything regarding the case. Um, so members just need to be fully aware. The union is saying don't use any personal device for school business, but a lot of us do because it's the most convenient way to do our job. Um, but that being said, you've been fully informed, I, I think is what we just need to know. Um, so yeah, so it should be fine to have both of these and you can add multiple accounts. I don't understand. So our, as long as they're using the staff account, they won't be able to get it. Right, just make sure you're using your staff account on your school computer. Right. So really, um, what I noticed was an issue. So er, last week we pushed out the tech survey and a lot of people emailed me. It says I need permission. It says I need permission. And here's why. If you were on your personal account, yeah, you can't access a Chimicum uh, survey. So you need to make sure whenever you're doing schoolwork or pushing out Google Classroom work, you are on your staff. CS. Oh, almost forgot. I got an easy place to get stuff. I'm going to record this. Well, Al, it, it also asks for permission if you're using that other nebulous. Hey, Al, I started the recording okay. already for you. Oh, good. Thank you. Because uh, yeah. I always forget yeah, that. Because I don't use it. Uh, yeah. I mean, that I was the, use my personal the, the other. The other CSD email bank also needs permission to talk to each other. That's where I was running up against all the time with my sixth grade class a few years ago. Because initially when I set up my Google Classroom, it was just the one with my name at csd.org. Oh gosh. And so all these kids were sending me information and I was sending them information and I had it, they had to have that layer of permission to be able yeah. to email. So yeah, because they're protected from emailing anybody but I thought they could email csd49.org. They could, but I think they can't. So then when they email us, see this is why for me on my computer, I've got Gmail open with my staff and I've got Outlook open. So I'm constantly checking both because you, 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 it, it's so much better, especially if you're working with kids because anytime they push out Google Classroom work, you can get notifications on your Gmail. You're in control of notifications. but. Uh, not Outlook, no, because they're two separate accounts. One is Outlook, one is Google. And you just got to remember, csd49.org is Outlook, Office 365. Staff.csd49.org, that's all Google. So keep those two I, on I, separate I tabs. Confused, so I don't have a picture of myself on purpose anymore. Um, I have a purple and a green. Oh. And I can tell who's who, which <laughs> means because like, you have two entities here, two Chimicum entities. Oh, that's a good right. idea. Okay. See, I got my face on Outlook, but I've got my classroom on staff. So you can do whatever works, but that's a great idea is have two separate ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Ooh, do I have that? Yeah. I got one face there. Ooh, this is a different picture. <laughs> But I look the same. <laughs> so, um, if we need to do a separate section of the last 
Both. I do both because the IT support tech request will log it, but if you email Tim, he'll get it twice. And I don't know. I'm uh, I'm into spamming to make sure people get it because I know me. If I get an email and it goes down to the bottom of my inbox, I'll forget it. So sorry if I spam people, but yeah, <laughs> sometimes I will spam. Okay, so that's the first thing to be sure of is that you're on your staff.csd49.org account. So the next thing um, for Google is if you can open up yet another tab and go to drive.google.com. This is a very important window uh, where you access a lot of resources. And there's so much you can do here. We could spend all day just on all the stuff we can do here. Drive.google.com. What comes up is my personal email drive. So, so you have to go up here. Yeah, you want to go up here and, and select this one. Make sure this your staff.csd. And see, this is what I find happens. I finally had to train mine. See how it says session expired? Because I have not used my personal Gmail on this browser. So here's what I do for to, to keep myself from falling into that trap. I then use a separate browser. I use Firefox mm. for my personal Gmail, that's, that's right. and I use Chrome for my school. That has alleviated all my problems. Mm. And if, if you're wanting a third layer, I, I downloaded a third browser. I picked Opera because it's the only one I know of. And I use Opera with my test student account because I personally want to see what students see. So everything I push out to students, I have a test account that I join so I can see if it works. I do my own beta testing, but that, that's just me. Yeah, I've heard one called Brave. Yeah, as long as you have, I mean, multiple browsers, it's just easier for me to switch from browsers than it is to do this. I mean, I'm sure this works just as well, go from my personal to my school, personal to school, but I found that then they, I, I have to always check which one I'm on. So Kate, if you go up here, I'm kind of trying to wiggle the mouse. It should say Google. We're right next to those nine, those bunch of dots. You should be able to click and see which account you're on. The picture. Is Does it say you're on your staff account? Yeah. So this is the most important thing for Google is make sure you're on your staff account. Yeah, I just signed up for the staff account to, to do the uh, survey, but I'm, I, I can't find the password. I'm, I'm a Google bug out on. Okay, I, I could here. reset it again if you want me to. Um, I think there was some. Well, okay, okay. All right, so uh, some important things you might want to know from here. If a staff member or a student ever shares a Google document or, or something with you, you have to click on or shared with me. And what you can see here, these are things that have been shared with me uh, from students. That way you know where to find them because sometimes somebody will say, oh, well, I shared this document with you so we can both work on it uh, together and you go to your drive and you're like, well, I don't see it. And that's why. A new feature that Google added was shared drives. So you get a lot of emails from Jason saying, hey, uh, on collaboration is where you keep your, your PLC uh, uh, minutes and things like the FNP, the champs resources, the robotics fair. When Jason refers to those shared drives, this is where you find them. And if you don't see them, just email Jason or whoever created the shared drive and they can add you as a uh, person who can see it. Because we have to add you so you can see these drives. 
Al, real quick, could you could you again show us how to get to where you are? I just got logged on from home to my Google. Oh, right now we're on Google Drive, and I just clicked on the the tab called Shared Drives on the left hand side of your screen. Um, this is Shared Drive. So I'm I, yeah, I'm showing the difference between Shared Drives and Shared with Me because they're both very different. Um, so shared drives, Kate, if you look at mine, this is what uh, elementary teachers have. The th grades three through eight transition team. Actually, I don't know if that's old or not. The robotics fair, champs resources. Yeah, if you don't have these, it's probably because you weren't uh, added at the time. Oh, good. So you're on there. Um, and, and for now, don't worry about, oh, and I turned those off. So yeah, turn them on. Sorry. I, I keep forgetting. Yeah, I, I, I'm just, I have this habit of turning it off when kids aren't here because I don't want. Oh, okay. Um, so back to drive, my drive. Uh, organization is kind of important if you're just going to create things for kids. So I would get in the habit of, if you're gonna make um, assignments for a, a, a certain class before you even start using Google Classroom, is go to new and put stuff into folders. The more you can be organized, the better it'll be for you later on. Yeah, so this new plus, this is where you access all of the Google tools. And if you go to more, uh, you, you should notice there are a lot of Google tools. YouTube is a Google tool. Um, so there are a lot of things here you can play with. And, and when you start thinking of how you're going to assign your lessons, your review lessons to students, uh, because this has a wealth of, of tools. So it's all accessible from here. So if I were to click on Google Docs, I would open a brand new Google Doc. And if I'm not in a folder, um, if you look at mine, here's what happens when you don't organize into folders. You've got stuff for days. But here's why I don't mind that. The nice thing about Google is up here where it says search drive. If you can at all remember what you called a document, just start typing it. So if I'm looking for EdTech resources, um, everything with the word EdTech will show up. And, and as you can see, a lot of things are populating, uh, but at least I'm not looking through everything. I'm only looking through things in my drive with the word EdTech in it. <laughs> I have a lot. So the search feature, once you start having a lot of documents and resources in your drive, don't forget that search feature. It'll save you time. And yeah, it, it, in the long run, it's excellent. So folders, um, one thing you can do if you start having a lot of folders like me, the folders you use the most often, if you right click, you can change the color so they stand out. Because I was noticing when I'd go to find a folder that I use often, I was scanning and scanning and scanning and taking me seconds to find. And I don't like wasting seconds, but by coloring it, I cut those seconds down. <clears throat> Every second helps. And this is a new feature Google uh, added, which I appreciate. Your most recently edited documents start showing up up here under quick access, which is really nice. And you can also, this, this uh, feature here, you can sort your folders and documents by name or when you last modified them. I'm down in this area. Yeah, where it has name. Mine, I forgot I had changed mine to last modified. And I find that it's not, I don't know, in my experience, it's not perfect because sometimes my folders don't come up when I last modified them. So I, it works better, I think, with uh, loose documents than it does with folders. At least that's been my experience. I have not been 100% sure that it's right but I don't know why I have not experimented.
So that is um, Google Drive basics. Um, and, and further trainings are how to use uh, any of these tools. But I, I can tell you, if you want to know how to use something, you go to YouTube. There are probably unlimited YouTube tutorials on how to use any of these tools. Google Forms, I think, would be a staple of distance learning because you can, on a regular basis, just poll your students just to see how they're doing. And, and Google Forms uh, lets you create exit tickets. Uh, you can survey your students just to see how they're feeling. And, and the thing I like about it is then you can open up the results in a spreadsheet and sort them any way you want, which is really helpful for me. I love to sort data and, and sift through it. So if you go to new, that plus, go to more, and then you've got Google Forms. And you got Google Drawings and Google Sites, some oft overlooked resources. Google Drawings, if you want your kids doing more than just typing text, they can um, uh, draw for you and, and it's all right there, part of your Google suite of tools. And some of these, I don't know if everybody gets them or if I just added them, but again, that's, that's more advanced stuff. But yeah, these are your three docs, sheets, and slides. Slides are great. Um, that's how you can make a website. Yeah. Not the most. There are some other ones, but at least that one's attached to your Google account. And it, that's the key. And kids love it. They know how to do it. For them, this is a lot easier than it is for us. Another feature you should be familiar with, if you already have documents and PowerPoints and, and spreadsheets created, what you can do is you can upload them to your drive. And if you go to settings, I think this is something you have to uh, uh, do. Let me see where it is. Oh, right here where it says convert uploads. I checked this box right here that says convert uploaded files to Google Docs editor format. Here's what that does. You have a Word document, you upload it, it converts it to a Google document. Because you're gonna wanna convert it to a Google document or you're still working on a Word document which gets into issues for saving and, and reusing. <laughs> Right. What you do is if you check this and you go to new file upload, it will convert it from Word to Google Doc. And you might lose some formatting because Word and Google Docs are not the same and Microsoft and Google are not friends. But it's, I found if you don't have a lot of formatting, it's, it's really good. So if you go to settings, settings and this one convert uploads make sure it's checked and also make sure you check offline in case you're at home and your wi-fi goes out because i'm you know let's probably think this is going to happen we're going to tax all our uh century link and wave if you do create offline then you can work on a document and then when your wi-fi comes back it will update uh, so when you click on the gear and go to settings, it's right on general. You got convert storage, convert uploads, language, and offline. Oh. No, I convert offline. That's odd. Yeah, I don't have that. Oh. Maybe I. It's just in Drive. Is that under offline? Yeah. You have offline? I have general and you have offline. How come you guys don't? I don't have it. Does it say convert offline? No. That yeah, that's weird. Mine goes from convert uploads to language. That's it. Oh, weird. <laughs> I, I the convert upload button. That's cool. Um, and and I'm I my only guess is either your Chrome's not updated or well, I'm using Safari. 
oh, you should be on Chrome for all of this. I would not use Google tools. Um, that's why I, I do my, my school Google one here. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it'll work on Safari, but Chrome is built for Google because Chrome is a Google yeah, browser. Right, right, right. Yeah, so if I'm doing school stuff, I make sure I'm on Chrome. Oh, I think there's a virus on my, my Google, so that's why I haven't. Have you ever seen the We Know virus? No. Yeah, it's on it, and it, it's some sort of tracker, and I've, I've tried to clear it, and I, it hasn't done it, so I kind of avoid those okay. applications. Oh dear. Well, and here's another reason I would recommend using Chrome is um, when you start, when we get into screencasting uh, and other features, you can only add these things to Chrome. So like my Nimbus uh, capture, if you're on Safari, you won't be able to upload it and, and install it. So that's another reason. Once you start using these, these other tools, you're going to want to be uh, on Chrome. So yeah, that's a good thing that came up. That's probably why your settings don't work because it's a Chrome thing. So, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm in, how do I get to, is there any way to get to that page? Your drive? Yeah. Yeah, if you click on Google Apps, you've got drive, or you can just, I, I like to type drive.google.com because once you type it in once, when you type a D, you just hit D, enter. Again, I, okay, I go for shortcuts. Okay. Uh, if you open up a new tab and type drive.google.com, That'll take you there. And Google is very deliberate about that. Drive.google.com, docs.google.com, sheets.google.com, slides. I mean, you get the picture. You put anything, as long as you know, like drawing, I think, is uh, uh, singular, while forms is plural. So if it doesn't work, it's probably a singular plural thing. But also, yeah, this waffle, they call it a what, what, waffle iron. If you click there, you've got access to the most used tools. And let's not overlook calendar. I'm going to create a calendar for my science classes, and I'm going to push it out to my team. I know this is my goal. Push it out to team leaders, because I've got a kid in each group who's responsible for calendar and keeping track of, 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 of being updated. Uh, you can share Google calendars with your students. But that's probably a later training because <laughs> there's so, I'm telling you, we could spend all day just it, it here. It uses me because my, I have too many calendars and sometimes I. It, yeah, and again, we can, we can spend hours just on calendar. So um, I, it opened up to my drive, but that's different than what you've got up there. It's got like my stuff on it. Right. So you got to close out or sign out of your personal account. So just make sure, yeah. Because it doesn't default to your personal oh, account, not your school account. Okay. Yeah, and that's what we were talking about, why I do two browsers. That way I don't have to switch here. Again, I don't know if it's a big deal or not, but if you go into Drive and you start doing something and then figure out, oh, it's my personal, uh, I just know that was a headache for me for the longest time. And one... The me? Is that like a Zoom type thing? It is. Yeah. And the only reason we didn't go with Meet, we were going to. We were going to try it. Uh, but then I heard from another school that they, their district nixed using Meet because Zoom, when we're done, I end all, it ends it for everybody. They found that when you end a, a, a Google Meet, the kids are still on it. And if the kids are on your school Meet doing whatever, then you're liable. Um, and I know some kids, they communicate with me through that Google Hangout thing. And for the longest time, because Sean um, Herschel, he was always saying, hi, Mr. G. And I'd see a message pop up. And for the longest time, I'm like, how is he doing that? And then one day I clicked on it. It opened up a Google Hangout. And I saw all these messages from him. And Sarah uses it too. And, and Sequoia, they love it. And they communicate with their teams. And I was like, oh. He's, I mean, they're already ahead of the game on this. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing about Google Meet slash Hangouts that kids can use too, if they can communicate with each other. Uh, so any questions on Drive and adding new and folders and uploads before we dive into Classroom? Do we need to get documents on the desktop? I know I was storing it. 
Yeah, so what I would do is say if I've got a sixth grade unit, I would open up that folder and then I go to new, file, upload. And then if I have a document like oh, my, so right. So this right here, you see it's a Microsoft Word document. Yeah. If I were to click on open, it would download it or upload it into this folder, and which is what you want to do. It. And it would convert it automatically. And, and that's what I uh, appreciate. And then if you have PowerPoints, it'll convert it to slides, which is really nice because then you don't have to convert it yourself. Yeah, and I highly recommend, I mean, I know if, if you're not doing the advanced PowerPoint and Word features, Google is great. It's all you need. It'll take all those animations and stuff. The animations, it might take them off, but you can add animations on slides. Slides is pretty powerful. I, I, I mean, I know I hear from the pros that PowerPoint and Word do things that Google doesn't do, but me personally, I've never needed those. So I don't even know what they are. I don't know what I'm missing. <laughs> so I've been happy with Google. So if you open up a new tab, let's switch to cloud. Okay, so like, uh, maybe you want to use your YouTube video, and then you upload that. Yes, and let's go to classroom so we can talk about pushing assignments out to your students. So at this point, if you open up a new tab, and I say open up a new tab so you can have all your other tabs still there, uh, go to classroom.google.com or use your waffle iron and click on classroom. And right now what you are looking at on my screen is all the classes I have created for um, my students including one I created for yesterday's train the trainer trainings. So I've got my robotics one for my morning group, homeroom, and then my three sixth grade science classes. Mm -hmm. So once you start creating classes, this is what you'll see. So right now, so right now the right. So yeah, so now you are going to uh, create your first class and let's walk you through it. You click on the plus that says create or join a class. As a teacher, you can join another class. Um, but I was telling Michelle, if you're going to join another teacher's classroom, ask them to add you as a co-teacher because that way you're not a student, you're a co-teacher and you can push out things to that group of students too. And Michelle was thinking for specialists, that might be a way, uh, or you can create your own. And then I think kids are used to this. They're used to having a class on here for each class they go to. So they have PE, library, science, language arts. So it's not a big deal to them. They know how to. My classroom, which I have here, I'd have to push it out for your classrooms. To begin. Right, because we'd have to have a way to give them the code. This says class code right there. Yeah. yeah. So let me create a new now classroom. Now can I ask a, just a quick question? Is there, would it be beneficial if we created a, a classroom for all of us that are on all the teachers that we could be sharing things. I mean, we could all yes. be at, we could all be um, the instructors and all be able to add resources just in a teacher well, here's, classroom. Well, here's what I did for the train the trainer session. I created this CSD Google Classroom resources class and I, um, I added, let's see, how did I do that? I added um, everybody who came yesterday to the train the trainer as a, here's what I did. I added collaborators. So you can see here are all the teachers who were here yesterday learning how to um, push this out to their, their uh, smaller teams. So we can add everybody or, or on here because this is what you wanna do. When you join each other's classrooms, you wanna be teachers. You don't want to be um, students. I mean, you could, but it's more powerful if you're a code teacher. So we can do that. And uh, yeah, so that would be, I wonder if there's an easier way. Yeah, that sounds great. Because adding one teacher at a time, that's a bit of work. Um, but yeah, uh, so this is one I started. I don't know if this is the one we want to use, but it's already here and a, and a bunch of teachers are on it. And this is where I'm sharing the, the tools I'm going to be presenting about tomorrow. Because tomorrow I'm gonna to do more of a 
well, I won't call it deep, deep dive, but a slightly deeper dive on some ways to engage your students with Google Classroom. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. Add ourselves to that classroom. See, that's the thing. As a teacher, I have to add you. Because if you if I give you the code, you'll show up down here like Courtney as a student. Um, and I'm and I'm wondering, I wish there was an easier way. It's pretty it's pretty quick though, because as soon as you start typing our names, it shows up. It is, it's quick, but it's it's not as quick as me putting up a code and having everybody do it and then emailing everybody. See, I don't know. I can do it for everybody who's here, so let me just do it for everybody who's here. We're gonna do it during class. Nope, you're not going to do, uh, no, don't, don't do anything yet. I'm just adding you all to this one as a co-teacher. That was my wrong, that was not my Google email. It's not? No. Maybe I clicked too fast. All right, let's try that again. Uh, there you, oh. There, there. it is. Oh, because it's orange. Thank you for noticing that. She saved me. All right, Jim. Yeah, and that's another thing. See, this, this is... In my mind, time consuming. Kate Miller, Kate DeVoe, Kate DeVoe. And then we got Thaddeus. Thaddeus. Boom. All right. And I already have Gretchen in there. Let me add Sean. All right. So let me invite these people. I think I got everybody who's here. So you should now have an invite for this on your Gmail or your school account. Okay. But we don't have to access that one right now. Let's go back to creating your first class. Um, so yeah, you probably already, Kate and Thaddeus, went to create class. Now here are some uh, uh, things you might want to know before you start creating a class. When you do your class name, I recommend uh, the year because I didn't do that at first. And I found out that as I looked back through the years, my classes had very similar names and I couldn't keep track which was which. So I would do 1920. Um, Google Basics. Uh, and the section, I mean, if you teach that class more than once, section is important. Otherwise, it's unimportant. So if you do the plus on the top right-hand corner and do create class, not join class. Right, so. No, you, get, you should just, just be, is, is the plus still on your top right-hand corner? There, so you should be your profile picture, your waffle iron, and a plus. That's what I see. So then go to home on the three lines. So I'm getting this thing. And then subject, I'm going to put technology and room 410. So, Al, you wouldn't suggest putting the date under, like, the class description or the section part of that? You want it as part of the title? Do you think it's part of the title? What I found is if you put it as part of the title, yeah. here's what's going to happen. Because here's what happens to me. Once you join a Google Classroom, it creates a folder called, why don't I see it? Uh, must be classes. Oh. I got it on last modified again. Okay, come on back. It's called classroom. When I open classroom, here's what I see. Um, so you can see I've got a whole bunch of period ones and I don't know which is which, but look at this. I, I, and you can see it took me a long time to figure this out. 1926 grade science, I can find that right away because eighth grade, eighth grade, I don't know which one's which. Sixth grade, sixth grade, sixth grade, sixth grade. 
it, once you use it for a few years, this is my nightmare. Um, I can, but I hate, I don't know, I, because once you create an assignment on Classroom, you next year you can reuse assignments. So I'm, I'm just tentative about, I'm a hoarder, yeah. <laughs> So you just have to be deliberate about how you name your class. Yeah. Uh, I did something similar to my uh, photo folder to start. Where I'll, I'll do two digits for the year, two digits for the month, and then, um, and then a word. Oh, yeah. Not like the yeah. So having a naming technique that's going to work year, be different year after year is going to serve you in the long run. So once you click create, ooh, I got invited to CES Library 2020. Oh, if you teach it more than once, you can put a section number like your period one, period two, period three. If it's just one class, I think you can leave it blank. So this is what, what is created when you do the digits. Oh, you're playing with rubrics? I have not. It makes so much sense. It is. It's a brand new feature. And uh, they've got the rubrics, and they do have a plagiarism checker. What, it's what they call them on there. Uh, originality reports, yeah. I'm going to go in. I, I'm going to watch a bunch of tutorials. I'm going to keep the second quiz. Oh, yeah, I got to do that. Yesterday? Yesterday. Yeah, it came out last So night. I did the one, the coronavirus one. I to do that one. I, but I want to do Pear Deck and I want to do. Do you want to? Touch my face. Head puzzle, Flipgrid. Flipgrid is. Flipgrid is the one where they record. I want kids to teach math lessons about particular Yeah, they can use the whiteboard feature. But that's hard though, isn't it? Can I? Can I? Can I? Like. They they draw just fine on those things with their... No, I'm talking about me. Oh, <laughs> then it's hard. Is that a good presentation <laughs> tool? Well, she did. To so use, like, compared yes. to other Blackboard kind of things, like Yahoo has one that I use. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's, like, it's what it's built for, so it might not be as good as the other ones. I guess you got to learn. I'm going to go in my classroom and do these tutorials. There it is. Sure. Right there. Yeah. Should I stay here? Because I, I like this conversation. But I don't <laughs> yeah, you got choices. Yeah. Um, so once you get to here, I want to show you a few things. Um, I don't know about you, but I love selecting a different theme. Uh, you see you've got some choices of what type of theme you can use. And if you have your own graphic, I think there's a way you can upload your own. So once your classroom is set, I've got my 1920 Google Basics, you go to select theme. Oh, yeah, there it is. Upload photo. Um, that way you can make it your own. So it's not just this. I think so. And I'll get to that in a moment. Right now, let's just change the themes to something that matches your subject. Um, but if you have to change a name or something, let's go into settings for that. There's some important settings here. So here, yeah, it looks like you can change your class details. You've got your class code. Uh, this one called stream, some teachers like it and some don't. Yeah. Uh, what the stream does, let me get out of it and, and show you one of my other classes. 
So you can see this is something you're going to have to decide for your own if you want. So jumping ahead, once you start creating assignments, you can um, separate them by topic, which is a nice way to put them into different categories. So you're going to have a bunch of assignments. And the nice thing about assignments is you can order them in whatever order they're supposed to be done by students. But then there's a stream. Whatever assignment you create now on your stream tab goes to the top of your stream. And what are kids going to click on? What's at the top of your stream? So if I want kids to be working on how fast, when they go to stream, they're going to see Pear Deck take away coronavirus. You can turn that off in your settings, uh, but then what you see is this communicate with your class here. I don't know which is better, but depending on what you want as a teacher, I'll be honest, sometimes the stream came in handy because I just pushed something out and I told kids it's the first thing on your stream, just click on it. But for distance learning, they're not in front of you, you have no control. So I don't know if you want to have your screen stream turned on or off, but this is a, a decision you can make right here. So here are the choices. Students can post and comment. Some teachers found out, no, don't do that. You will have a long stream of kid talk. So definitely do not pick students can post and comment. Um, students can only comment. I would not recommend that. Uh, only teachers can post and comment. Yeah, that's what you want to do. But then under classwork, you can show everything. You can show condensed or you can hide. So if you hide it, nothing's going to show up there, which forces kids to go into your classwork tab, which is where I want them as the teacher. So maybe that's better. So you say hide notifications? I'm making a case for it, but I've never tried it. I've had, uh, I've had the stream on, and I noticed kids go there first. I have to tell them to go to classwork to find assignments, which makes me think hiding is best but I have no experience with it. So, so. I have a, an assignment already on my classroom and it is posted as a notification. So does that show up to anybody who shows that first look at my Yeah, when kids go into your classroom, that's where they go first, to your stream. And that's what, and they're gonna see whatever you have posted most recently, which for this distance learning, that might be what you want. So you have to make the call on that one. But I just wanted you to know where to do it. Uh, cause I know third grade teachers, this is what they needed to know is how do you keep kids from commenting there? And then grading, luckily we don't have to worry about grading. So you can change this to no grade and just provide kids feedback. Cause really that's, that's what they need. Feedback. Um, so I guess grading, we don't have to worry. And then you can save your settings. So good. Now you've got your settings. And then when you are ready, this is your code for your classroom. And this is what we were talking about earlier. Um, those of you who uh, are just setting up your classroom, you're going to need to send teachers your code so they can push out to their kids. And then you'll notice kids adding you uh, once they start joining. So if you're a specialist like Sean, you say to all your teachers, hey, here's the PE code. When you go to people, you'll be able to see all the students that have joined your class. And, and, and another thing you can do is you can invite students, but I can tell you they don't check their Gmail. Few of them do. Uh, so they, you can invite them. They may not ever get that because they need to know to check their Gmail. Yeah, and so when you invite them, you have to input all their emails like you were talking about. Earlier. You have to you put have in to their emails. Automatic. No, you can't just say, I mean, I, you'd have to find a way to, to what, what I think you can do, and, and I would do is go to Skyward, make a spreadsheet of all their emails, copy them all at once, paste it there. Yeah, because if I'm going to invite Sean as a student, I mean, it does show up pretty quickly. Oh, look, Sean Herschel. I can invite Sean Herschel. Um, and, and then I invite, and that's going to go to your Gmail 
her, you, no, no, actually, no, I take that back. Let me invite and tell me now if you didn't just get, like I got this CES library, it shows up there. So maybe invite is the I way to go. I just got a, a classroom invitation from you uh, for the Google basics. On and it's, email. oh, so you got it on email? Yeah, but that was earlier. Oh, no, that was right now. I got it on the email. And you said if I go to a classroom. Did you get it on your Google Classroom? Because if you do, then, yeah, oh, perfect. Well, that's even better. So if you, yeah, so you can invite kids or you can have teachers push out your code. Both ways work. Should I decline that if you just send it? You can accept it. So we set up your classroom no, because I had the kids all in front of me. I said, here's my code, join. Oh, so you just gave them the class Yeah, and that. notice this feature when you click here is so they can see it from where they're sitting. So this is ideal for the kids in front of you. Um, but we no longer have that luxury. But if you record a screencast, you can record yourself going, all right, class, pause this video now and join this class. On screencasting, we're going to get into that topic tomorrow. We kind of glossed over it yesterday with Nimbus. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to do a, I can't call it deep, but deeper than yesterday's. <laughs> okay, so now you're here, you're, you're going to have students. Yeah, there's my first student. Um, and now is the important part you are now ready to create assignments and um, push them out to your student. Here are the choices you have. This is what I was mentioning to Mitch, why I don't delete my old classrooms. Once you start pushing assignments out, you can reuse an old assignment and you don't have to recreate everything. Material is where you wanna give them, say, just a link to a resource. Hey, go here watch this um, or go here to play uh, uh, prodigy or whatever this one's really nice because you know how i turned off students able to comment if you post a question you can put a prompt here prompt goes here instructions answer the above prompt and you, uh, hopefully, I'm assuming you're going to send this to all students, but you have the option of making assignments that only go to a subset of your students. I've never found that useful, but other teachers were like, yay, hallelujah, it's about time that's here. Um, you can make it ungraded, and, and this is going to be hard. Now we are teaching asynchronously, meaning you push out an assignment and kids do it whenever they are able to. So one kid can do it next week. One kid's gonna do it tonight at two in the morning because they can't sleep at night. Uh, you now can then say, let's have this set for two weeks from now. And then that's it, that's your last chance. And the nice thing about setting a due date, if kids do it after the due date, it shows them as late. I don't know if that's a big issue now. Yeah, they can still do it. So you can make due dates or not, it's up to you. But I think setting limits uh, so kids know, okay, that assignment is overdue. Let's move on to the new one. Right. Yeah. Because otherwise, they'll wait till, you know, whenever to catch up. Are you putting due dates spread out through this six weeks? Or are you putting the due date as April 27th? Yeah, I, I think for this, like Gretchen said, in order to structure it, I might give them two weeks per assignment, depending on how involved the assignment is. If it's just a question, you know, prompt like this, I might make it a week. Um, and then. And that's really helpful for them right now when they have 24 hours of, I don't know when to do whatever. Um, and I highly recommend organizing your content into topics within your classroom. 
So you can create a topic and let's say this prompt was about COVID. I can call this my COVID-19 topic. Um, and even for a question, you can add any Google Drive tool you've created. You can add a doc, you can add slides, you can add sheets, you can add a drawing. This Google Drive, anything you create on Google Drive, you can add here. Links are for links to outside resources. Files are things you have on your computer that you want to upload so the kids can access. Say you have a 3D file for them to open up on 3D Builder. Um, and then YouTube is for clearly YouTube videos. So when you are sending kids a video to watch, use the YouTube button, not the link button. It's not a big deal, but it's, it's this one's ready made for YouTube videos. You can also create one on the fly. Right here, you can create any of these. Pushing out forms through Google Classroom is really helpful. It just keeps it organized for you and the kids. And then when you go to ask, the kids can now reply to this. So I'm going to add my student account and show you what this looks like. Because it's nice to see. And even though I gave you to a period two class, that was the assignment for period one, two, and three. Um, my, God, my topics didn't go to the second period. No, it doesn't. Class. I think I've run into that where you. Oh gosh, I, I, I don't know. I've, I've had issues with that. I just, yeah, I don't know. You'll just have to, yeah, yeah. I think I've had that issue. Uh, so some things, yeah, when you create an assignment, if you have multiple classes, you definitely want to create it for all three or all four or whatever at once. But yeah, there's some things that you have to go back. If you want to change something, you got to go to each class and change it. But some things you don't, and I'm not to hip on that. Um, so right now I switched to my student account and you can see, so I, I, I scratch whatever I said about kids have to check their email. If you invite them to your classroom, it shows up next time they log into Google Classroom. Oh, I should have known. Uh, and then the kid will join. So this is me as kid. I am kid. And uh, oh, let's see. Oh, nothing here. Oh, I have to know to go to classwork. Gosh, yeah, maybe putting something on stream is better. So now I've got only one assignment. View question. This is where kids can now answer the uh, question. So let's see how that works. Type your answer. My answer goes here, Mr. G. And then they turn in. And this is how kids do your work. And then as teacher, so now I'm going to switch back to teacher screen. Ah, see, I learned from yesterday. I have to share the correct screen. I go to classwork. I go here. I go to view. And look, it tells me one assigned because only one student opened it and one turned in. So I go to view question. And here is what I can see. So I can see Sean and test two. And I know Sean hasn't done it, but I see test two turned it in. So test two is ready for feedback. I can now reply to test two. That is correct. Blah. And you see how each kid gets individual feedback from you that doesn't go to the whole class and, and they read your feedback without a grade. They actually are gonna pay attention to your feedback. So this no grading thing actually excites me um, because now they have to read your feedback. So I, Posted that there, I'm going to push it out. And now this student, when they log back into Google Classroom tomorrow or next week, they have my answer. And you can have a conversation going with that student right on this prompt. 
And what I don't know, Sean, can you go in as a student and I want to see what, if you can, uh, if you and I can reply to each other. So once students start joining your classroom, you'll see them when you, uh, when you click on the, on the assignment. So right now, and I shouldn't say assignment, this one's a question, because as you can see, assignment is its own uh, type of create option. So let me switch back to my student one. And let's see what Sean and I see. Okay. Oh, do you know if these are live, these outlets? Th those outlets are. Uh, the ones on the back, you have to turn that one over there on for them to turn on. Sorry, I turn them off so we don't waste electricity. So check it out. It says here, see classmates answers. Oh, okay. Just had to press the reset button. oh, yes, that happens often on those. So this is cool. We can see each other's responses student wise. So you see here, <laughs> hope we get through this quickly. Now, I can't reply to Sean, I but I. Hear. <laughs> that was my first. I was like, "Geez, Sean." <laughs> I got it. It 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 occurred to me after I. Yeah. So notice this. I can go from my answer to classmates' answer. See, this is new for me. I don't use this often because I have a different learning management system. Um, but kids can see. I personally think it's great when kids can see each other's answers because then they're getting all these other perspectives and i wish they could reply to each other here because this is the place where i want them to uh, with distance asynchronous learning discussion forums are a, a it's a staple that's how universities do uh distance learning online learning so we might need to find out how kids can do that here and i thought this was it but I don't see a way that this student can respond or reply to Sean. But at least we can read each other's answers. And then when I go to one reply, I can see what Mr. G wrote. Yay. So, all right, so that's something we need to experiment so, with. So when I, you know, I'm in as a student, so when I type my answer and turn it in, I get a little, box that says see classmate answers and then oh, cool. click on that and I see your answer and then their answer. Oh so you or can see answer. what I wrote to them? No. Oh but, okay. Wait, just say one reply. Wait, yes, I can see that. Oh okay so I stand corrected. It is not a private response to that student. I also do have though a private comment. That's what that's what I was thinking of then. That that would go right to the student then, right? Yes. Or to the teacher. That's that would not be shown. Right. So let me go back to here. So I'm now on my teacher screen. Prompt goes here. That's my question. Um, two turned in. So I can reply to Sean. And I guess see that's what I wasn't noticing. Uh, if you look, it says add class comment. So what I type here goes to the whole class. So where, you um, where it says when I clicked on add reply, that's when that showed up. And it, it's, it's grayed out, so you probably can't see it very well on my screen there. But if you um, click on it, then you will see it. And I just ignored it. I didn't read it. So now I see it. So if I click on Sean, this is where he's saying add private comment. So yeah, note to self, be aware of when you click reply, every kid in your class will be able to see it. But when you do private comment, that could be a sidebar you have with that kid. Oh, cool. Let's see what it looks like. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oops, what is the what? So this is a uh, question. Yeah. Because this is one I don't use much, so I wanted to try it out here. So you've got, I'm just going through these. So I mentioned material is just pushing out things that you just want kids to look at. And this is the question feature. And the only thing I wish it could do 
that maybe it's just a setting somewhere I need to find is make it so kids can respond to each other. I know that opens up a can of worms, especially with kids desperate to communicate with each other, but I don't know. They need that. So it's an option. Um, I haven't used quiz assignment very much. So I'm sorry, I'm not very familiar with that one. You'll just have to experiment with it. Assignment is the one I use the most. Um, and this is where I'm gonna go back to change it to ungraded topic. You can create new topics as you go along. And this could be my um, uh, water pollution because that's what we've been doing in science. And yeah, this is where Gretchen was experimenting with adding a rubric and originality reports. If your kids are typing uh, uh, multiple sentences to the paragraph realm, you want to check originality reports because if they plagiarize, you'll know. Oh, how will that change each other? Like plagiarize with each other. Ooh. Will it check that? I don't think it can because it's checking through Google internet search. So that just comes to you. It doesn't come to them. It that if you check the originality report, they don't see that. It, it I don't know. Teacher. I haven't used it, and maybe we can experiment with each other. Uh, but I know from what I've read, you open up their essay, and it'll run the originality report. But we we should maybe experiment with that. And... Be nice if they told the, the student right when they were doing it. I, uh, yeah. yeah. Stop yeah. plagiarizing. <laughs> Yeah. All right, give them a warning so they don't even bother. Yeah. So water pollution essay instructions. Uh, write what you learned. Okay, I, I wouldn't do it that vaguely, but. <laughs> and um, I can add, so here's the thing. Okay, so you have, I'm gonna pick something I already created. Oh dear should have prepared for this. Let me do my intro. No, I don't want that one. Coronavirus, alternative. Oh, these are all, ooh, trash cleanup. I don't know what that is, but I'll select it. <laughs> so when you upload a, a document to your assignments, look at the choices you get. You can make it so it's just a document students can view. But why would you do that? Um, if you choose students can edit it, every student can edit your one copy of it. Don't do that unless you want a shared document where everybody's typing all at once. So one reason you might need students to view is like if you have an article or something that you're putting up or something that you've written, so they can just, you don't want them editing that, but if you want to put up an example of what you're looking for, you just want to be able to see it. And then, then you can attach the second document. You can attach any document, video, link that you want yes. to any assignment. So then the next one might be the one you actually want them typing on, and that's what you put make a copy for each, each student. And can you only do that a certain number of times? I have read on 10 years. Okay. I have photography class where I put up four or five videos of their typing that you have to do. But I mean, for make a copy, I've run into where I choose make a copy, I add another one, and the make a copy isn't a choice anymore. Let me try it and see if I, if, if that is no longer a thing. So make a copy for each student is the best in terms of if you want kids turning in individual work because they will open the assignment, it will on the fly generate a copy of the Google Doc you created for them. Then they work on it and when they turn in, Google Classroom organiz organizes it for you by class, by student, and then you can go in and read each student's. And you can even go read one student's, give them feedback, click on next student, give them feedback. So your workload is very much uh, organized by Google Classroom. For organization, it is phenomenal, uh, amazing. You can do two boxes. One is the turn in, and then the other one is assign. Assign or turn in. I, I could say with their reading journal, I already have one turned in. Whoa, they're fast. <laughs> I was um, thinking about a workbook that you, I use uh, for some of the homework assignments where I get copies of it every point in my books. So I'm amazed that they're only one and a half. So I'm, I'm just curious. 
I can scan them and make them a PDF, but I'm just curious, can I scan them and make them anything that they can write? You'd have to convert it to words so they can write. Yeah. yeah. So I'd have to type it all. You could, or there are plenty of online tools called PDF to Word. I mean, it is, and it's not ideal. No, that is not ideal. Yeah, because that's a lot of work for you. Yeah. So Al, my yeah. first assignment is a daily exercise routine where kids have to keep track of the exercises they're doing. So right now it's just as a Google Doc where students can view the file, but this is something that I want them to, to fill in because it's got a, 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 a chart or whatever they're keeping track. Right. So should I change that to students can edit the file? Or are you saying that's a can of worms? Well, if you do, then all 500 students can go in and edit that file. So, so as students can view the file, can they still manipulate it by typing in? No. So you don't want each student to have their own copy of that file so they can type just their information in? Right. That's so you want to choose, um, so let's see, let me pick one here. You want to choose make a copy for each student. I don't have that option. I only have students can view the file or students can edit the file. See, that's what I was telling Gretchen I ran into. Are you still on Safari or are you on Chrome? Maybe that's why. Yeah, because this is, you're going to need make a copy for each student. Otherwise, right. otherwise, here's what they have to do, and you're going to have to teach them how to do it, is if it's view only, they can go to file, make a copy, but then they have to reattach it to your assignment. It's too much to teach kids, especially the younger ones. Even with kids in the room, that's a nightmare. Um, so I can, yeah, I can upload multiple documents here and make a copy for each student. Um, now for the students can edit file, a real nice thing you can do with your whole class is you can, um, create a Google Slides presentation with a slide for each kid. And you can upload it where students can edit file with the instructions, please only edit your own file. And uh, know that if you change the background, only change it on yours because you will change it for everybody otherwise. It, it's another can of worms, but it's a nice collaborative project. Our kids, it's nice if they could practice collaboratively working on one document because this is a skill they're going to need in life. And sure, they're going to mess up, but hey, we're all in, in a, a strange situation. Let them mess up. Let them experiment. Uh, so if you want to try that, it's an option. Can we set up small groups that work together? Yeah, and that's that feature right here where you can assign it. You can assign different assignments to different students and you just came up with a great reason for this which I haven't I haven't used yet because yeah I'm thinking I've created assignments for that I want all students working on but yeah if you put them in small groups um, they can each small group can have their own Google slideshow so once you um, have this set up and you click assign you can assign it to just one class, or if you have multiple classes, do remember to assign it to all of them. Now I've got my water pollution essay. So let me switch back to my student view. Okay, so now we're on, oops. Now we're on student view. So student goes back to the classroom. And again, I turned off that stream. And now I'm thinking that was not a good idea because when kids go to stream, they see nothing. And they might think, I have no assignments. So now I'm thinking, not a good idea. So I'm going to run back and undo that. And here I thought I was on to something. And the two choices then are, do you want to show everything, attachment and details or condensed? Condensed has worked well for me. So now I go back to student view and refresh. Let's see what happens. So now they can see, see the water pollution essay, which was the most recent one I assigned, goes to the top. So that's the condensed version. And what would the other one show? 
I don't know. I haven't tried it. <laughs> um, so notice the two documents I said make a copy for each student are showing up here. Um, and I'm going to open one of these and I'm going to, ooh, I didn't turn on originality reports. Let me back up. Because I want to try totally plagiarizing and see what original, originality reports do. Um, so I'm going to go back to, so here's a good thing. If you ever forget to do something with an assignment, see the three dots over here? You can go to edit and it takes you right back here. So now I can click on originality reports. It says you can enable, enable originality reports on three assignments per class. Oh, that's not cool. Howdy. So we've got originality reports and I don't have a rubric created. Ooh, I wonder if I have an old one. No, I'm not gonna look for it. Okay, so now I'm going to update that assignment and switch back to student view. Let's see what happens when we plagiarize like crazy. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go to Oceans. Let's see if I can find an article here. Oh, let's go to updates. So are there recommended questions for doing like the tech survey with your parents or students? Probably. I mean, Jason mentioned some of them. So I think we should maybe get together and figure out so we don't forget a question that's really important. Because, yeah, we're going to run into that. Hey, Al, what was the question? Oh, he wanted to know if there were um, questions that we should all make sure we ask on the tech survey that we send out to families. Um, I emailed that out just uh, a little while ago, so it's on your district email. Yay, perfect. If you can, try not to take the survey. Just see if it'll let you navigate oh. through it. Okay. Can I have one of the copies of the sheets of all the things you handed out to the guys yesterday in your... It, has some, you have it might be in the recycling. <laughs> oh, I, I, love a, I love a copy, too. And I made a new one for tomorrow's training. Oh, okay. It's more targeted at... Plus, it's going to have links. Okay. Al, would you be able to email that out as well, just on regular Outlook, so people have it? Email what? That um, the sheet that they're looking for in the trash. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the trash sheet. Okay, so let me experiment here. I'm going to. I don't know who made this doc. I think. Oh, this is test two. Yay! All right, so I've got some words here that are mine and some that I fully plagiarized because I'm a smart kid. I, I, I have trained a lot with this teacher. She's a science specialist at ESD in, in the East Side. And she has a saying, she tells her students, if you're not cheating, you're not trying hard enough. And I love that. Because in, you know, in some parts of life, the cheater is gonna prosper. <laughs> so I'm going to turn this in and all right, I'm turning both in, even though I didn't do the other one. So it looks like it turns both in at the same time. Darn. Oh, by the way, um, this is something you're going to need to know as a teacher. Let's say your student turns it in, right? When I go back to my document and I reload it, it is now going to be view only. If I go to type, I can't. I don't know how many times I've had kids say, I can't um, fix my document, can you unsubmit it? And I said, no, 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 but you can. So you need to tell your kids if they sub turn in an assignment and then forgot something, they have the power of unsubmit. If they unsubmit it and reload it, they can now finish and fix. For example, if they had second thoughts and they're going to unplagiarize, they better unsubmit real fast. Uh, but yeah, that is huge. They have to unsubmit. So when they click on turn in, it becomes unsubmit. It makes you able to do everything on their document. It gives you full privileges. It takes editing privileges away from them. 
so they can't fix it while you're in the middle of reading it because then you're not getting yeah that's going to be a nightmare okay so my student submitted it now i need to go back to let me switch my share screen go back to teacher mode all right so let's see what i've got here um water pollution essay let me go back because i don't know what i'm seeing here oh dear turned in okay so this one's turned in wait am i on the wrong screen yes i'm on the wrong screen i'm like what am i looking at i was looking at the student one okay so i'm on teacher i see one turned in i'm going to view assignment and it was this student see how it says turned in for test two under Sean Meacham, it says assign. Sean hasn't turned it in. I'm not going to bother uh, looking at his. So this is what I was saying. Once you launch a student assignment, notice here, I now have test two and Sean, all your students are gonna show up here. So you can read this student's work and I can jump from uh, the two documents they were working on. Here's trash cleanup. And here's um, the other one. And I can switch from this student to Sean Meacham. And there I've got his two uh, documents. So they added this feature to make your workflow much more streamlined and much easier. Okay, so I'm going to go over here to test two. And it says one flagged passage. Oh, only one. Let's click on that and see what's happening. Oh, look at that. It flagged this. It said flagged passage, no cited or quoted. And look, it showed me the web match where it got it from. Student busted. They got all of that from the oceancleanup.com. It works. That's pretty cool. I love it. <laughs> um, and then if you look at percentage, 83% of their work was flagged as not theirs. <laughs> So this is great. So we're set up for this. That is beautiful. So Gretchen, um, check this out. I, um, as a student, these were my words. This was all copied and pasted. So when I looked at the student, it said one flagged passage. You click on it. Look what it tells you this was all flagged as coming from this website, theoceancleanup.com. And when you click on percent, 83% was flagged as not their words, and it was not cited or quoted. What's that? Okay. That is fantastic. Well, that's what I would so say. Let's try that. Because, yeah, if they cite it, at least they're giving credit to where they got it from. So let me um, return to student. Oh, yeah, that's a feature you need to know. So and sorry about the phone thing. I, I totally thought that we could do that. No. OK. That would be too cool. We can. No. Take the phone home? No, can you go through your cell phone to your desktop? Uh, there's an app out there for it if you wanted to do that. I know the name well, and, and yeah, she's one of the ones who would need, we were talking burner phone yeah. for those of you who have to call okay. students. I don't know if they got burner phone that we can still get their app for. Yeah. Um, is there any information on the app? I'm not really sure. So we need to follow up with the district and say, what's the plan for yeah, I think those of you who are? Yeah in need so I, I can change the, the password on my classroom phone so i can see the messages but it's still coming up as the previous teacher like on your phone yeah like when i call into the phone it's, it's, it's coming up as the, what do you get now remember oh we don't believe it you have to Thanks, Tim. Okay, so 
as a teacher, you are going through student assignments. Um, you can, my method that I love to do is like as I'm going through a passage, if you highlight a uh, word or words, you click on this plus, you can add a comment. Uh, check your resources to make sure that's true or something. Because that way, when the student gets their document back, they can read through my comment, edit, and then click resolve, and then I'll know when they resolved it and, and resubmitted it, which is really helpful. And then for this one, I can say something like, um, <laughs> either cite your source or write in your own words. So now you've evaluated their work, given them feedback, and you now return. Student will be notified and can check any grade you left. Uh, and I didn't leave a grade, I just left comments. So now I've returned this one. Let's switch back to student view and see what they see. Okay, so they should now, okay, so now it changed from unsubmit to resubmit. And the student can then open up their document and they should see my comments. So let's say I fix this one. I, so the student has choices. They can reply and say, okay. Um, in which case maybe they, they needed more help. They're like, I don't know what you mean. And it's not resolved. Or if they resolved it, they do this and boom, that's cool. And then this one, they resolved it. So let's say this, I mean, I can't cite that much, but let's say I want to cite this one. Um, so how do I cite this, Gretchen? Clean up website. So might that be enough? Yeah, let's see if Google picks that up. Okay, so they added a citation. They go back and, and they can turn in from here too. Turn in is here resubmit is here. So there's both ways work, whatever the kid does. So if they turn in here, and this is annoying, it now opened a, another tab of my, and I, I know I have a lot of tabs, but they're not all the same, so I got to go clean up. Okay, there. So now I've got this cleaned up. Let's close this, clean up. Okay, so let's go back to teacher mode and see what just happened. Okay, so student resubmitted, what do I do? Do I have to refresh? I refresh anyway. Okay. Oh, good. Okay, so let's go here. One flagged passage, let's see what it says now. Nope, still says no cited. Wait, what happens when you click on this? Oh, I can't click on it. Okay, so it still considers it not yeah, well, I got rid of two whole paragraphs. Um, so maybe they have to put quotation marks and actually add a official looking citation. That's good to know. Okay, so it can't, it's not as simple as saying this. It shouldn't be that simple. So this is, I am loving these originality reports. Love it. Yes. Are you considering a multiple choice? So that is the easiest. You can make a Google form quiz with multiple choice uh, choices and then you as the teacher goes in and selects the correct one and you can have students as soon as they submit your quiz they can see which ones they got right and which ones they got wrong. Um, short answer, I do that on my Google Form quizzes too. But Google Forms can score that. You have to go in and score each student's short answer individually, which that's how I do my test. I do give them some multiple choice because 
it's, it's nice and it's easy for them. And that's like what I would call my level one and two students. If they get the multiple choice ones right, that's good. But to get a three, which means you've met standard, you have to get the short answer ones correct. Um, so at this point, it's 1130. How about a half hour to uh, make some assignments? You've got Gretchen and me in here who use this. Sean has experience. You guys can ask us for help. And then at 12, we take like a half hour lunch break. Yeah, so half hour work time. So Jason, if you wanna pause the video till 12.30, we're gonna have work time now with support and then come back at 12.30 for the next part of this. Perfect, sounds great, Al. All right. I just can't find you. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm here somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I know, I had to look down in my menu, my bottom menu to find this thing. Okay. Okay, we lost Thaddeus. But we've got Kate. Okay, so we went over drive. Oh, um, just so you all know, I just sent out an email to all CES. And I might as well refer to it now that I've got everybody here. Um, I, I created an agenda. Uh, for a training that uh, Jason asked if I could give tomorrow and I'd be happy to. These are some of the tools that I shared yesterday with the trainers in the train the trainers session. And if you are ready to learn some more and find some amazing things to do with your students, the tools that I have chosen here, uh, first of all, screencasting, I think is gonna be our main way to provide FaceTime and contact with the kids and, and do our review lessons. Um, and I've got a tool that's free that I think we can do uh, all our screencasting with. Then I've got some tools here, Adobe Spark, Flipgrid, Edpuzzle, GimKit, Pear Deck, and then the ones down here that, first of all, the ones I have used, Book Creator, Pear Deck, GimKit, Edpuzzle, Flipgrid, Adobe Spark, especially Flipgrid, Edpuzzle, Pear Deck, and, and uh, GimKit, I can honestly say engage 100% of the kids 100% of the time. And if we're going to send stuff home, we're competing with kids being able to open up a new tab and do whatever they want. They could be playing Minecraft. I mean, if their parents are at work and they're at home with a computer, if I was the kid, I'd do what's more fun. So if the work coming from my teacher is engaging, fun, maybe has a competitive element, I might be more likely to do it. So that's what I am planning for tomorrow. The time that I put there are uh, very tentative. I'm not very good at sticking to times, but my hope is that I could show, people try, move on to the next one, show, people try, move on to the next one, and, and then, over the weekend or whatever, when people have time, they can explore more deeply and we could ask each other questions. So that's what I'm, I've put together for tomorrow. Um, and yeah, hopefully people will join. And since we're supposed to, Jason, we're supposed to be joining virtually tomorrow. Are we not allowed to congregate in small groups or whatnot? Um, I don't. I think I was just thinking it seemed like a good opportunity to see if if we could do this, um, you know, practice a little what, what we're preaching. But yeah, if people don't want to and you want to come into the building and maybe just go to your own room and use the Wi-Fi there. I mean, but if you want to congregate like that, that 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 works for me. I was just thinking if we could try it, I think it would be a good opportunity. Good. So at least people who read this can see, okay, I'm interested. And I also thought if you just want Flipgrid, you know if you tune into the Zoom at around 11.15, I can't promise or guarantee, but around 11.15, we'll probably be done with Adobe Spark and we'll move on to Flipgrid. 
And that's why I put the schedule together. So maybe people could pick and choose what they want to zoom in for. Uh, but yeah, I just sent that out to all CES for your consideration. Pal, if, if I have other teacher pals that would like to um, join, can I send you their name and email address? Yes. And that way I can invite everyone who's interested. Okay. You certainly can be. I don't have a list yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's what we got to figure out is I need to know who's, uh, what, what I'll probably do is just generate a um, email with the join link, send it out to everyone, and then you can send it out like to other people. And so I don't miss anybody who wants to join. Um, Cause yeah, I'm trying to think of the most effective and efficient way to do it. Are you do it? Yeah. Cause I, I don't want to zoom from home. I'm gonna be right here. Hello. Hello. Good. Um, I'm in the middle of a session, so very quick. making video for what purpose just to upload to YouTube so not for screencasting just a video oh um, Nimbus is good for screencasting I would say screencast matic is a bit more robust because I yeah I'm, I'm most familiar with the screencasting tools plus if you want to do more than just record your face you have that option, but if you're just going to make a video, YouTube Live, or yeah. Yeah, I'd say, um, yeah, I, I, I would have to dig into yeah. that because I, I just use Screencast-O-Matic. Um, yeah, so I'm really, yeah. Sure. All right. Bye. screencast o -Matic is good stuff. Sorry, Greg needed help at the high school. Okay, so um, we've had time to practice. So teachers here have created at least an assignment and we learned a few things. So we learned that when you first go to create assignment, if you, um, minimize this. If you assign it and then come back and add a new document, like right now, if I add a Google document to this assignment, I have the option of students can view the file, students can edit, and remember when you choose students can edit, that means every kid in your class can edit that one copy of it, which is your copy of it as well. But the best one for having students do their own work is make a copy for each student. Well, here's what we found out and Sean found out that's what was happening. Once you click assign, if you did not already choose make a copy for each student, you will no longer be able to. So here's what I mean. I've already assigned water pollution essay. So I can go back and edit. I can go back and edit. I can change everything on here except if I now add a new document my choices are limited to students can view students can edit I no longer have the choice to send out a copy to each student which is weird I don't know why but that's the way it is so Sean correct me if I'm wrong you had to remove the assignment and and create it all over that's exactly what I did so that would be a pain. So we just have to remember as we're making assignments, uh, don't assign it before you make a copy for each student uh, before that is selected. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, especially if you don't have all your resources. Now that being said, notice when you click on, uh, so let's say I'm making a new assignment. And instructions here. Uh, don't just click assign if you're not ready. Go and you can schedule or save as draft. 
So if you save it as a draft, it won't show up for students, which is thing number one, that's really good. Maybe this is one you're working on for later and you don't want your students working on it before they finish the water pollution essay. So at any time you can go back into your draft, add your Google Doc, and you can still make a copy for each student. And let's see what happens. I'm gonna save draft. And now if I come back to edit, I should still be able to add another document. I don't know what that is, but I'm selecting it. And yes, you still have the choice to make a copy for each student. So as long as you save as draft, um, you're not locked in. Did you already assign it? Can't attach this file. You don't, oh, <laughs> that wasn't my file. I can't attach it. Okay, note to self, you can only attach things you create or have permission to uh, attach. So are there advantages or disadvantages to choosing assignment over material? Like I, 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 did, I did mine by material, but I'm realizing I, I could have done this assignment also. Yeah, and I've, uh, I only choose material if it's something I don't need students to ever turn in. If it's just a resource. Yeah, if you want students to be able to work on it and turn it in, you should make it assignment. And um, I've never tried quiz. Oh, look what quiz assignment does. I've never tried that. Because usually I make my Google form first and then I attach it to an assignment. But looks like if you do it this way, um, it created the Google form for you and then you must have to go in and put in the questions. Yep. So that's the difference between assignment and quiz assignment. Uh, but if you've never played with creating a, a Google quiz, um, so you have to go here to quizzes, make it a quiz. And if your students have Chromebooks, which uh, most of our students use Windows 10, you, you can turn it on locked mode because here's the thing. Since we don't have to worry about grades, this isn't an issue, but if a student was gonna take an actual test at home on a Google quiz, if they're on a Chromebook, you can lock it so they can't go Google the answer. But if they're on a regular computer, yeah, they can open up a new tab, Google the answer and get it right every time. Um, and you can see the choices you have here for remote distance online learning. I want the students to see their grade immediately after they turn it in so they can get instant feedback whether they got it right or wrong. I want them to see what they missed. I don't mind them seeing the correct answers and, you know, points if you're going to offer points for that quiz. So this is pretty cool. Um, and I was telling Kate, we were talking earlier, you can do multiple choice questions. And the nice thing about a multiple choice question, sorry, I can't think of anything good. Um, I know, I, I wrote, what is your name? And it said, that's not a multiple choice question. It knows better. Okay, so you just created a multiple choice question. Um, and yeah, I always require questions or kids won't do them. When you go to the answer key, you choose the correct one. And then done. That way when students take the quiz, when you selected, uh, they can see their grade and their missed questions and correct answers. Now they'll be able to see, no, my name's not Bob, it's Al. Because that is the one I chose as the correct answer. So it's, it, it automatically scores their multiple choice. But we don't all wanna do multiple choice quizzes all the time. So if you add a short answer question, and it's now a paragraph, um, you can put an answer key, uh, but remember this, Google can't score it unless they type it the way you typed it word for word and spell it correctly and everything. So don't expect Google to grade it. You can enter feedback. Did you write blah, blah, blah. Um, and then students can see, and they should be able to self-assess, but as the teacher, 
you can then go back into all your quizzes and um, score the short answer questions yourself. So it's a powerful tool for assessment uh, if you haven't used it. And don't forget to name your quiz. Um, Cause yeah, I, I forget to, and I hate documents being called untitled. I hate a blank quiz being called blank quiz. <laughs> Oh, let me check. So Thaddeus posted something and he wants me to check it. All right, so let me get out of this. Okay, let's go back to, is it a new class or is it the same class? No, well, I, 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 yeah, it could be, could be one. Okay, hot air balloon simulation. Oops. All right, view materials, uh, yeah, untitled document. Yeah, so now I should be able to, so it's view only, I can't type. Yeah, I can't type. And I can't change the title. So did you mean it to be view only? No, no. Oh, oops, it's still view only. Yeah, so you can make it, make a copy for each student. So let me get out of here. Go to classes, make sure, okay, yeah. So we just, we're learning how to make sure students can edit the document and they get their own copy so they're not writing on everybody else's copy. That, that's. Okay, maybe I wonder if that fits the material rather than. Oh, I wonder. That would make sense because the material is not meant to be editable, I don't think. Right. Ooh, we just discovered something. <laughs> Al, is there, a, is there a way for us to do what you're doing and see the student screen? Because um, So my recommendation, especially for tomorrow's training and really for this one too, is that while you're watching, I mean, ideally, you would have Zoom on a separate screen like your phone or another computer, and you'd have a computer where you're doing what I'm showing, ideally. If you only have one computer, what you're going to need to do is minimize or exit full screen on your Zoom so you can go back and forth. And it's going to be a little tricky because you're going to be doing, I'll show something, you're like, oh, go back to Zoom, see what he did. But then you can stop me and say, can you show that, show that again? Um, or if you can do a dual monitor. If you have a dual monitor at home. But I think most people have a phone. So if you're Zooming on your phone, you got your phone right next to you, you're watching what I'm doing on the phone, and then you're doing it on your computer. That's what I'm going to recommend for tomorrow, because then it avoids the issue of having to switch back on your monitor. Yeah, I just have like, dual monitors. Like, Gee, you're lucky. Um, yeah, dual monitors perfect. Zoom on one side, and then your browser on the other, so you can do, because the best way to do it is do it while I'm showing it at the same time. Um, that's the best way. Because the other best way is I record a how-to video and then you're playing it while you're doing it, but then I'm not there live. So there's pros and cons to each way. But the nice thing is the Zoom tomorrow, I will record it and I will remember this time, hopefully from the beginning, and then I will upload it to YouTube and then staff who either couldn't make it yesterday because they were still learning level one Google Classroom or staff who want to go back and go, okay, that Flipgrid one, I really want to go back and try it. You'll be able to do that at your own leisure. And this goes back to that asynchronous learning. We're going to be doing that a lot too, together. Um, a combo of synchronous and asynchronous. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow. So let's see, am I on Chrome right now? I think I am. Okay, so uh, I just created a new document and I think Oops. Whoa. Um, are we what? Yes. I, I, I just went on even though you were talking because we were still all together. So you missed uh, how to do this. Um, but I do want to go back to this Google Form thing. If, if you're not familiar with Google Forms, um, let's go there. Open up a new tab and, and go to forms.google dot com because I think Google Forms are something we're going to want to make use of. 
And if you notice at the top for start a new form, you've got some templates already made for you. And if you click on template gallery, there are some ready made uh, Google Forms for you. There's one called assessment, exit ticket, worksheet. And I haven't tried these all, but some of them are good. So let's say you want to do an exit ticket once a week. If you click on the template, it's ready for you to go in and uh, make it your own. If you're not happy with the picture that's there, this um, puzzle piece, no, that's for add-ons. Ooh, no, that's cool, but that's for more advanced. Uh, this palette, art palette for customized theme. If you go to header, image uploaded and click on that, you can change the header for your uh, form. So you can make it your own. And you've got, as you can see, different categories of image types. And one thing you can of course do is if you have photos, you can use that uh, as your image to make it really customized, make it your own or you can upload something really beautiful you have on your computer. So I have some lovely class craft backgrounds that are a good shape. These should be rectangular, um, but as you can see here, you can move it around and you can change what shows up. Uh, but let's say I wanted that one done. And then it changes it. And then I think, yep, as you can see, the background color even changed to match it. I mean, that's pretty cool. And you, it, it gives you a choice of theme colors. Looks like it picked colors right from the image. I am impressed. That is pretty darn cool. But yeah, you can make it your own. So you just want to make it pretty. Again, you're, right now, we have to hook kids into what we want them to do because it's hard enough to make them do what you want them to do when they're sitting right in front of you, but now they're nowhere near us. So the only way we have control over hooking them in is making what we send them beautiful and enticing, or at least so new to them, they're gonna be like, what's this? I'm gonna click on it and try it just because I've never seen it before. So everything here is editable. You can go in and, well, before you leave class today, that doesn't make any sense. So you can say every Friday, um, answer these questions or something like that. And then one thing I like to do, I always have a name uh, uh, question for kids because I want them in the habit of writing their name. But for those who don't, no matter what, I, I always click collect email addresses. So if they do refuse to give me their name or they just put their first name or a, or a, a nickname, I still know who they are and I'll have, I'll be able to keep track of them. Um, this is always good because it's safe. We restrict it to only kids with student.csd49.org. And if they run into the issue where they're on their home Google account, they won't be able to do it. And they will ask you, it says I need permission. And you're like, use your school account. And then if this is something you're going to do every Friday, you don't want to limit it to one response. And I don't know if you want them to edit. I mean, these are things you can choose for yourself, but that's what, how I like to do it. Uh, and then since we're collecting their email, you do not need this one. So I get rid of this. It collects their email automatically. And then you can change these questions, but you see these are a uh, long answer text. Uh, so you can get a, a feel for what, what they're going through at that time. And yeah, you can check in with your kids this way. And, and then whether you require the question or not is up to you. But know that if you require a question, they cannot submit the form until they put something into the, the, the uh, question. And one thing we get a lot if kids don't want to answer, they put IDK. That's enough for the form to submit. Sadly, we should be able to say, when I think we can, there might be a way to limit uh, or, or validate. Yeah, response validation. Let's see what that does. Length, minimum. 
wrong answer text. Oh, I wish I could say no IDK, or as Mitch said, IDN. So it looks like at this point you can just do, ooh. So regular expression doesn't contain IDK. Um, so I went to these three dots and I chose response validation because I'm looking for a way where we can keep kids from just putting IDK or I don't know. And, and this might be the way. Custom error text. You have to think. Because <laughs> that's what they're, they're not telling us they don't know. They're telling us, I don't feel like thinking right now. <laughs> and that's not an option. So yeah, so this is something you can play with. And what I recommend is um, test it yourself before you push it out to students because any uh, way around it or any glitch, they will find it. And um, which is okay, but if you find it first, even better. Okay, so you have a exit ticket. Now we can create, let me just get rid of this one. And I'm going to delete that one because it was just a test. So now I've got a form with my exit tickets. I'm going to go to create assignment and I'm going to call it exit ticket. Please fill this form out every Friday or maybe you can send one out every week instead of having them go to the same one. And again, I, I always want, try to remember to make it ungraded so they don't have to worry about that. And then when you go to add um, Google Drive, since I just created that form, it is the first thing that shows up. So whenever you add Google Drive, it goes to defaults to recent, which is really nice because if you just created it, it'll be right there and that'll save you some time. Um, but if you've been creating documents, they should all be here. So hopefully you'll find it or you can just go to my drive. But watch, when I add this, there it is right there. I assign it. And, ooh, I didn't give it a category. Huh. Oh, well. I just try to keep it neat. So let's see what student sees. Back to my student account. This is Google Basics. Look, it's right at the top. So Thaddeus, this is why I thought, let's keep stream on there because that way when they first go to your class, they see something. They don't think, oh, that teacher has posted nothing. So I go here and see under your work, there is nothing there. But when I go to exit ticket, boom, there it is. Let me just see if I can do IDK. I'm Al, IDK, ah, you have to think. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> that is really cool. So I, I, I did a form validation, and if they put IDK, it gives them an alert. And I typed this. This is the message they get. You have to think. <laughs> yeah. So they can't submit it until they do. And, and now they can come back and go, I don't know. So yeah, they're gonna do that. We know they are. Um, at least we made them type a little more, yes. So one feature I do wanna show with everybody that, um, oh gosh, kids don't really know this, but if we know, we can tell them. Uh, if a kid is on an assignment and they wanna create something different, so you sent a Google document, but they're like, you know what? I can draw that so much better than I can write it where it says your work. Have you noticed there's a plus add or create? No matter how many documents I assign, let me go back to an, a previous one, my water pollution one. Look, it has this, but if I unsubmit, it also has this add or create button. Um, if a student goes there, look what they can do. They can now make a drawing, a Google drawing. And when they submit or turn in the assignment, you as the teacher automatically get access to see their drawing. They don't have to share it with you separately or anything like that. Um, so now 
student opens this up, look, it has their name and the assignment. You don't have to read untitled drawing, which I know that would drive me crazy. Untitled drawing, untitled drawing, which kids submitted what? And I know my class students have used this and they figure it out pretty well. I don't teach them how to use Google drawing. I mean, they're, they're mostly familiar with shapes. You can add shapes and, and color them in and do things. The one thing I have showed students is the scribble tool because it's the only tool that allows them to draw uh, a non-standard shape. Because otherwise they've got curves and if you use curve, it, it's weird. And so they have to figure it out. You gotta make a closed curve. Hey, there's a cool math lesson. Mitch, did you hear that? He's not here. <laughs> yeah, but you can insert, kids, kids can insert images. They can search the web for an image. By the way, did you know when kids are on a Google Doc and they're searching for an image, it searches Creative Commons image so they're not taking copyright content? Uh, this is really awesome. And if they use stuff from a Google search, I think it cites it automatically or it creates a citation for them. So Google's got some sweet tools when you click on insert uh, and search. So if I search for a balloon image, I can click on my pretty balloons and insert and then do stuff with it. I can, oh, let me get, oh, oh no, I forgot. Eh, this is why I don't like that one. <laughs> uh, I can move this around and interact with it and change things. And uh, for a simple drawing app, which is not as sophisticated as like paint.net on the computer, kids can do a lot with this. And as I said before, when you switch to your teacher, oh wait, let me turn it in. Uh, turn in. See, and it turns in everything all at once. That's good to know. Now I'm gonna switch to my teacher view. And I go to water pollution, view assignment. Test two has got three attachments. I go, whoa, what is this? Oh my goodness. Yeah, this is evidence of learning. This kid knows the concept. You get a three, even though we're not grading. Um, so yeah, I, I just thought that's a nice feature most of us uh, may not be familiar with. Now I wanna go back to something Gretchen said earlier. I'm going to switch to a different class just so you can see. Um, I have an assignment here that is uh, uh, full of stuff. So let's see. Where is it? Because I want you to see what it looks like for a student if you put multiple resources on a um, one assignment. I was in the wrong category. Hydro so check this out. Um, so this is the document students are working from. When they click on it, this is where they can type. So they're giving me their team members' names, Bob and Missy. Oh wait, no, that's their team name. Scratch that. Team members' name is Bob and Missy, and our name is the Dragons. Uh, and then it's got instructions, what they do, they type in here, la la and type here. So that's their working assignment, but these are all the resources I shared with them. So they can click on this and read about the 130,000 gallons of sewage spill into Puget Sound. Um, so that's what it looks like for the student when you put multiple resources in one assignment. And I've got the instructions written up here too under my direction. So this is what one of my uh, completed assignments looks like from the student's point of view. Well, it's probably a good idea when you're starting out then to create um, like a student account where you can view what It's do. really helpful, um, but here's the problem. Your student account has to be a um, student.csd49.org account, um, which most of us 
don't have access to create student accounts on our domain. Um, so I don't know if it's something we want to do is create a test student account for each teacher because I find it invaluable. <clears throat> exactly. How, how, and, how do we go about doing that? Um, you would just have to ask Tim or me to do it and just give us a name you want us for that student account. I, I think, and I can ask Tim, we have unlimited with our school Google. So we should be able to create a test student account for each teacher. And then what I do is I have, like I said, my Firefox browser is for my home Google account. Everything on there is personal Google account. My Chrome is just for my staff.csd49 account. And then my third browser is all my student account. So you can see what I've got open here. I've got my student blog open. This is where I show kids how to create their blog posts, and then I show them what their blog will look like. So this was the claim evidence reasoning assignments they did for me, and this was my model saying, kids, this is what it should look like. Um, this is their uh, portfolio entry we did last year, and I told them this is, and this is when we do water quality. So I create things here as a student on a student account, so I can show my students and have a model for them to look at. I've got my blooms here as a parent so I can see what parents see. I find it valuable to always make a dummy account to look at things because I don't know what they're seeing. Can we back up for just a second? I just created a new form. Um, but if I wanted to link it just to my classroom page for my students to fill out, how do I do that? Link it to your this? Yeah. Um, so what I did is I created an assignment. Oh, you created an assignment. And then when I went to add, uh, I added mm -hmm. a Google. And then it, it just showed, it was the first thing because it was the last one I made. So if I hit send after making this form, where does it go? So watch, when you hit send, you have choices. Your right. choice is to put email address right there, right. which you don't want to do. Um, your choice is to get the link and push it out somehow, which you don't want to do. Your other choice is to embed it into a blog post or a web page, which you don't want to do. Uh, so what you do want to do is create an assignment on Google Classroom and attach it to that assignment. Oh, so I don't send anything, it's just already created. Right, I see. yeah. Especially if you're using Google Classroom, let's keep it all organized. Right, right, yeah. Okay. Now, speaking of forms, so let's say you're doing forms and you've pushed them out and things are coming in. Let me find a form to show you the fun part of it. Do you need me? I was just gonna take this one. Uh, no. <laughs> no, no, I have a, um, um, uh, like a brief announcement without being panicky, but my uh -oh. brother-in-law is a, he does, he's a first responder, and it's possible, it's possible that tomorrow could be, like, it could be just, like, it's, it's in, possible realm of things that tomorrow is going to be a stay at home situation in our state. I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen. He's saying it could possibly happen. I, I heard at lunch that the district office was told that it could be a national thing. Yeah. Wow. Oh, oh wow. Okay. For like a couple weeks. Yeah. Wait, a couple of weeks of stay at home? How do you do grocery shopping? Well, those are those part of those things that you can still do. Yeah. The, it's like the, what they're doing in the Bay Area right now, the sheltering place type of thing. That's, that's they're not they're doing, doing. Like, it. It's not in, it's suggested, it's not in, maybe they're not enforcing it. Well, it's an yeah, yeah, the district yeah. office was told that possibly the National Guard would be mobilized mm. to Ooh. enforce. So you mean if I come from home over here, I could be forced to go back home? 
Well, if that's true, then I'm just going to take my favorite bottle and what you <laughs> Wait a minute. I'll tell you what I'm going to do about it. Oh, wait, okay. I'm going to set to stun. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Al, I, have a... back, I will set to kill. <laughs> sorry. Al, I have a quick question that is, um, I don't know, you may have answered it earlier in the day when I was off getting my battery in my computer, but... I sent home kids with packets because for music, it's tough. You just, there aren't a lot of things out there that are ready um, made for them. So my question is, if I'm assigning something for them that they already have, is the best way for them to send that back, like to take a picture of it or do they scan it from their computer? I just. That's what a lot of teachers have been saying because here's what they were thinking. Okay. If kids put it back in an envelope and, and drop it off at the buses. Mm -hmm. Then we're having people handling things with germs on them uh, and then bringing it back to school. And are you going to let it sit for three to 10 days before you open it? Taking a picture and, and attaching it to a, a, a Google assignment okay. is the best way. Or yeah. just emailing you the picture if parents have it on their phone. Parents can then take a phone, email it, or take a phone, take a picture and email it to you. Honestly, that's what teachers are saying is the best way, and I agree. Okay, that's kind of what I thought, but I just wanted to kind of double check what everybody was doing. Thank you. Yeah, and then at least we can tell students, we got it, great job. You know, at a minimum, it'd be nice to offer that to students. Thank you for sending that, great job. Yeah. Um, so once you start pushing out forms, I want to show you what you're going to see, because it's pretty awesome. So here's the last test um, I gave out, and it's a total of 31 points. And what I did is I made a whole bunch of what I thought were easy multiple choice questions based on what we practiced in class. But then my last set of questions were all um, long answer, or long answer text, short answer uh, for me. Now, what I have here, and, and oh, wait, this is no new responses yet. Yeah, this was going to be my test makeup. So let me show you one that actually has responses. <laughs> I forgot. I haven't reassigned it yet. Um, so let's do, where's my Ocean Guardian one? There it is, Ocean Guardian. So once students start responding to your uh, survey, poll, quiz, whatever you do, you'll see on this tab, responses 58. When you click on it, there's a couple of things you can do. Summary is really nice because if you asked a question that has more than one choice, you can see what your spread of data is. So how familiar are you with air pollution? I've got a majority of kids at the one or two level saying, I'm not familiar with it at all. But I've got two, three, four kids who say, hey, I know a lot about water pollution. So I get a pulse uh, right there. And you can see it, it just provides quick charts, especially if you do a multiple choice question. Uh, and I always follow up my multiple choice with uh, explain why, why you selected that so I can get a little more insight. You can also view the responses by question. And this is their name, so that is quite a waste. Um, but once we get, oh, I have to go to the next question. Clumsy me. What do you know about air pollution? I can then see what kids wrote uh, or, or how many responses I got. And the difference between this and the question uh, aspect on Google Classroom is that the question aspect is only one question right on. and the form has multiple. Yeah. So the form you can ask multiple choice, short answer, and you can ask as many questions as you want. And if you're doing the um, ask a question, one question it's, you should use the question instead of the form. Yeah. So in my mind, this question was ideal for class online discussion. But as we saw, kids can't seem to be able to respond to each other. Okay. But at least they can read each other's responses and read the teacher feedback. Okay. So it's, it's, it's got some uses. And it doesn't um, populate the answers like you were just describing that the form does, right? Right. It does not. Okay. So 
Yeah, and, and individual, you can go kid by kid and read what they wrote. But another feature I love about forms is this green button right here. It says view responses in sheets. If you like, are like me, like uh, uh, using spreadsheets, you will love this because now you've got all the kids and their responses and I can do something like copy all of this. I usually, if I'm gonna edit something, I, I, I move it out of here because I don't wanna mess with the student responses. Every time a new student response, it comes right in at the bottom here. But I just copied all of this. I can now open up a new sheet, paste it here, and now I have the ability to sort. So I can go into uh, data and do a, okay, I gotta select it. Let's select all do a sort range. And if I want to sort kids by uh, their understanding of water pollution, I now sort it. I can see all my ones. All oh, these kids are the ones who need extra support with water pollution. I can see all my twos, threes, and so forth. And then these kids at the bottom, well, it's Amber who scored herself expert at water pollution. She knows a lot. And, and then these. So that's a really powerful feature of, of forms, especially where, when you start getting data. Where, where is the green button? So when you go to responses, it's at the very uh, top of the form itself. Okay, that, right Once you start getting responses. Right. right. And that's why I wanted to show you, because if you don't see this, how do you know it's, it's available? Um, so that's why I opened up a, a previously administered survey. So here's what we've learned so far today. Let's kind of review and then do uh, uh, more of a you guys working with with support. Uh, so we've learned how to let's go back out. Oh, by the way, yeah, this is something you, you need to know. So when you click on your link right here to your class, it takes you back to your front page where it says stream. Uh, but if you go to the three lines here, you can move from one class to another, or you can go to the home where you can see all the classes you've joined and created. So some of these classes I've created, but CES library I've joined. So this is one that I've joined as a uh, either teacher collaborator because I see there are zero students. So I guess I'm not a student on that one. Um, so we've learned how to go here right now because from the home button, you can click on the plus and we know you can join a class if you have the code or you can create a new class. So we learned how to do that. Uh, we then learned how to change like your class title do title it with some kind of system that you don't get the same name year after year and you've got your class code we said stream make it so that only teachers can post or comment unless you really don't mind your kids populating your stream with their comments and posts which honestly that that's going to get overbearing really fast as teachers have found out. So only teachers can post or comment. We kind of found out that showing condensed notifications is probably the best. Um, and if you're gonna invite parents, you wanna have guardian summaries. So Michelle, this might be, let's see an example. Um, this page here shows you what parents will see. Oh, that's cool. I've never seen this before. So yes. If you click on see example, you'll see what parents will get uh, if you add them to your child's. So it's in settings. It's under guardian summaries. If you turn that on, there's a link to see example so you can see what parents will see. Because I've never used that. I, I have parents on, on Classcraft instead of Classroom. Under general. Guardian summaries. And yeah, then you can see an example, especially if you're gonna invite parents. It's nice to know what they will get. 
So, so you don't have guardian summaries? General class code stream, classwork, show deleted, guardian summaries. Oh, well, we're learning all sorts of things here. Uh, yeah, because I'm able to turn mine on or off. Maybe it's because I invited a parent. Maybe it turned that on. Yeah. So we learned how to do that. Uh, then we went over to, oh, we also learned that under people, you can see your students and invite guardians. We also learned that we can invite a guardian with any email, a Gmail or not. You can also add teachers. If you're gonna co-teach a course or you just want another teacher as part of your course, you can invite them this way. Then we practice creating uh, assignments is where we spent most of our day, but we also now know what materials are probably used for most likely. We saw you can ask a question, but it's one question. Students can't respond to each other, but they can respond to you and you can reply to them. And then quiz assignment, it just starts the Google form for you so you don't have to start it. Um, and then once you have some posts, the reuse posts might become very valuable. And that's it. We haven't gone into uh, Google Calendar, but if you do start generating due dates, it adds it all to your Google Calendar. And what you're going to see is whenever you create a class, you now have a, a Google Calendar for that class. It automatically creates it for you. Um, and it'll put, if you put due dates, it'll show up in your Google Calendar. And sometimes I get alerts that something is due and I'm like, oh, I should have turned that notification off. <laughs> so be aware if you do due dates, um, you might want to turn these calendars on or off. But the nice thing is it does it for kids too. So they will get notifications when something's due, I think. Worth a shot. What else? Um, and that's, yeah, that's what we've done so far. We've gone over forms, Google Docs, Google Drawings, Google Sheets. We haven't done slides. I don't know if you guys wanna play around with slides because slides are really cool. Um, so if you go to new Google Slides. Yeah, so I went to Google Drive, sorry. Uh, uh, I mean, there, there's two ways you can do this. And, and I'm, I like to create my resource first, then create an assignment in Google Classroom. But Google Classroom is set up so that you can create a new assignment and create your resource at the same time. That doesn't work for me. I'm not that organized. Oh, I have a question. Yes. Um, I have been trying to create slideshows using slides, um, and I just want a picture on each slide. So I have, um, you know, say I have 30 slides or 30 okay. pictures, um, and I just want to dump them into. Google Slides and have one picture per slide. Do you have to do that one at a time and then reformat the picture every single time? Or can you just dump 30 pictures and then all of a sudden have a slideshow? I'd like to say, yes, you can dump 30 pictures and have a slideshow, but I'd have to Google it because I don't know how. I haven't been, I've been trying for a while. I can't figure it out. So I thought maybe you would know. Yeah, I know that sounds like a perfect thing, but at, at this point, I only know how to do them one at a time. Um, okay, so from my drive, I went to plus new, and then Google Slides, because Google Slides, I think we should all be familiar with it, because sometimes it's a nice way to, just visually different. Did you lose your drive link? I mean, tab. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay. Um, so the first thing when you start an untitled presentation, don't forget to title it. Uh, but did you know, I think this works with all of these. Once you add a title, um, sorry, I couldn't think of a better one. I think once you click up here, yep, it automatically titles it whatever you write first, whether it's a Google Doc. I think it works with Sheets and, and also with um, slides. This is pretty nice. So all you have to do is click up here and whatever you titled your first slide, it titles your whole slideshow. Um, but the first thing you want to do is pick a theme. And you've got some nice themes here to choose from. And then once I pick a theme, I like to close this so I can have big space. I like big space. Uh, and you know, your first slide, like PowerPoint, is usually title and subtitle um, by Al. I don't, I'm not that creative. And this is uh, on, on Google Slides. The plus here is where you choose your, uh, what your next slide is going to be. So you know your, your main one is title and body. Uh, if you're just going to do a picture, you could do a caption, title only, and then add your picture or blank. So like for what Michelle would do, if you're going to have a title on each one, nature. So I gave my title and then I go to insert image. And if you do search the web, they will be creative commons or public domain images. Let's see what happens if I type nature. Oh, I like this one. And then depending on the image size, if it's a small image, it'll show up small and you'll have to resize it uh, large. And if it's huge, it'll show up huge and you have to resize it small. And if it's somewhere in the middle, yeah, you're going to have to make it look the way you want. But notice there are guides here. This tells me it's in the middle this way and in the middle this way doesn't work. So I just want it somewhere around here. And I can also use my up and down arrows. Uh, so this is a, a, a way to give your students lessons in a, in a more visual format. Uh, that goes from one to two to three to four. And I also like to use speaker notes to put links in at the bottom and you can tell the students, hey, pay attention to the speaker notes. There are resources there for you. But once you create your or generate your, your slideshow, then like we've learned, once I create make a new assignment, COVID-19, in nature then when you go to add google drive it should be the first thing and it is COVID 19 add now when you're submitting or, or sharing a google slideshow look you've got the same three choices if you make a copy for each student maybe you just send them a template and they fill it in which is what we want to do have students creating as much as possible but if you do this one, this is what I was mentioning before. If you now do students can edit and I assign it, Sean and I can now go in and both edit that form at the same time or asynchronously, which will probably be asynchronous because who knows when he can go on and who knows when I can go on. So if I switch to the student view, here's what we've got. Okay, I'm gonna leave this classroom. Go to Google Basics. So, Sean, if you could go on, let's uh, let's have a little fun. COVID nineteen. So now I open it. Both Sean and I. Once we're both on, we can both edit it. So I see the teachers on. That's my teacher. Hey, it's got my phone number. That's cool. That's the wrong number. I'm five nine six zero. Oh, that's the school. Okay. Hey, that's kind of nice. What is it? No, I went. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> um, so if I add a new slide, this is a slide that I, the student, am creating. The teacher did the first one, and there's Sean. I can see he's now on. So Al slide, and then I can add something. And if I want to change the slide template or layout, I can make it a uh, 
there so I can add text. COVID sucks. Let's go back to school. And Sean's adding his own slide. Do you see how I'm doing number three? Sean's doing number four. And look, when I go down there, I can see who's doing it. And I can say, Sean, you and I are both on at the same time. Oh, and here's what kids will do. Okay, how do they do it? They go to, okay, they know how to talk to each other. And I want to figure out how, oops, wrong button. Comment, maybe this is it. Comment. Whoa. Um, Because I find when I've done this in class, this is what ends up happening. I see them all really excited. I'm like, why are they so excited? And then I look on one kid's screen, and there's just a whole slew of, hi, hey, blue, blah, just garbage. Um, but they can do this. They can uh, communicate with each other. And, and the real purpose of it is so if you're in your home and I'm in my home, we can be working on one slideshow and communicating at the same time. So for workflow, this is awesome. And kids, of course, use it for fun, but it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and then comment history, it keeps track. So you can go back and say, oh, you said you didn't do it, but look, it says right here, that was you at 140 today. So yes, busted, you did do it. And then I can go on Sean's slide and add something, which he may or may not want me to do. Oh, excellent question. Every Google product, um, I think it's every, you can go into uh, file, version history, C version history, and it's, it keeps track of everything everyone's ever done. And look, it has all three of us by color, so you should be able to go back and figure out who did what. So if somebody wrote the F word, you should be able to find out which kid did it and when, because uh, it doesn't go away. That's what they need to know. <laughs> if you do something and I can find out who it was, because it should have it by color. Yeah, so excellent question. You can do that with docs for sure and slides, pretty sure with everything. And where did you go to get the, uh, the images? Um, I went to, if you go to insert image, look at the choices you have. You can upload from your computer. I do search the web because then you're not limited to what's on your computer, but you can use stuff that's in your Google Photos, Google Drive. You can take a picture. Oh, let's do that. That's too much fun. Oh, I want my camera. Never mind. <laughs> Hello. Can I interrupt? Yes, for a yes. Moment? Okay. So I'm not sure about what tomorrow is. You're doing something and just... I'm going to be launching a Zoom, okay. inviting everyone, and that's what I plan to do. So I just don't know how to do Zoom. So what I'm, you're saying is I'll get an email? You'll get an email, click on the top link, and it'll, it'll launch everything for you. It's really that easy. You yeah. Your, All right. Your cool. laptop. Okay, I'm there. Yeah, and if you have a camera, you can you can show your face too. Otherwise, you'll just hear my voice. Yeah. I hear you. Then? You can hear me, and if you unmute your mic, we can hear you and everything going on. Mm -hmm. So if you have dogs barking, you know, okay. mute your mic. Like Karen right now. Hello. <laughs> See? Okay. Okay. <laughs> and if I uh, so this is what we. See. You can do it, sweetie. You can do it. Yeah. Oh, There's yeah, Tina. Yeah. And see, so if you don't have a camera, it'll just show your name. Or if you upload a picture, it'll show your picture like Jason's. Karen, hello. <laughs> show. And see, you have control. You can turn the camera on and off, so oh, you can. Can you show me out. where that is? She said it's right there. Um, it's down here. Stop oh, video, sure. mute. Ah. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, it's wow. it's really You're sweet. You're making this easy for me, Al. Zoom what? does it. <laughs> Zoom is easy. I, I really like Zoom. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. If you mute yourself, you're like going to have a coffee and <laughs> nobody knows. You're welcome. Yeah, well, you're documents and, and presentations on Google, but you want me to email them. 
and we've got to go back to Office 365. I need all a document. Like I've got this document I need to get to to all the different grades so they can put in their packet, but it's a Google Doc. That is an excellent question. So this is something, yeah, you all need to know. So you've, let me go back to my teacher account because this is awesome. Okay, so let me find, uh, oh, okay, this one right here. So I sent this link out to this Google Doc and everyone was able to go in and see it. Here's how I did that. Uh, let me go and create a new one. Just yeah, you could download it, do an attachment, but why? <laughs> Come on, this is a Google thing. Um, so let's go find something here. Oh, Mike, how to caring comic strip, how to care. <laughs> okay, so you may have noticed all documents at Google things have a blue share button. Ooh, I've already shared this. So here's what you can do. And I like to go to advanced because it gives you more features. Every document, slideshow, everything you create, only you can see it. When you attach it to a Google assignment, it automatically shares it with every kid in that class. You don't have to worry about it. But if now you want to share it with people other than the kids in that class, you're going to need to fix this. Um, the hard way is one person at a time, type their email, send them a message saying, hey, I just shared this with you. Come in and take a look. Before you send it, who are you sending it to? Because if I send them this with the pencil, they can edit. Do you want them editing it? Uh, if not, do you at least want them to comment? Or do you just want them to view it? Know what you're doing. But if you've got multiple people, like you're sending it out to 100 parents, here's what you want to do. Right here where it says specific people can access, go to change. Look at the choices you have. Uh, these first three choices are for Chimicum domain only. But if you want parents to access, you could make it public on the web, or you could protect it a little bit and do this one, anyone with the link and it defaults to can view. This is what you want. Anyone with the link can view. So you save it, um, and I'm gonna cancel this and do done. Now when I go to share, it has anyone with the link can view, copy link. The only bummer is the link is long and ugly, but who cares? If you paste it in an email, they can click on it. And that's how you share documents, slideshows, spreadsheets, drawings with everyone in the world. So will those links expire? Nope. They are forever until you go into share and uh, advanced and change it back to off. And Google used to have a link shortening service called goo, G-O-O dot G-L, and they discontinued it, uh, but those links are still active. So they discontinued the service but their links are active forever. I think it, it, every time a service of theirs isn't used enough, they drop it so they can focus on their new services. And I think Bitly and, and other link shorteners are way more popular. And I started using bit.ly. I like it. It gives you a lot more control than Google did. So I can, I like it better. But if you don't want to give parents a huge link, I would recommend starting an account with bit.ly and shortening these long Google links so they don't have to see super long stuff. And a great feature of bit.ly is you, after the bit.ly slash, you can put a title to what it is you're sending them to. So PE fitness report, you can put that. And then when people click on bit.ly, bit.ly slash PE fitness report, they know what they're clicking on instead of this. And another problem with this, have you ever gotten an email with a super long link and you clicked on it and it didn't work? And then the person said, oh, you have to copy it all and paste it in a thing. It's because sometimes the page break return, whatever you call it, carriage return for us old typer people, um, if it cut it off, 
when you click on it, you're not clicking on the whole link. And that's an issue, which is why I personally like to shorten links. I'm a link shortener from way back. So I'd, I, I think at this point, more work time and, and before I overwhelm you with more, I've given you a lot. It's, it's work time, play time. We can stay here. You can go and email me, whatever serves your needs right now. I think we're here till, or we're working till four, but you guys are gonna work anyway. So it doesn't matter where you do it from. Uh, but how are you feeling in terms of what you wanna do? Does that sound good for the rest of the day? Yeah, because you, you, you have a lot to play with. Yeah. And um, if you want to have a test student account, just send me an email with the name and I will create it so you can do what I do and just have a way to test things. Yeah, and also let me <clears throat> open it up in a separate window and I found out <clears throat> I was in fact able to edit it. Ooh, cool. Yeah, and that way... You could. Yeah, in this class, I will probably archive. Otherwise, I'll get confused. Yeah, this has been a lot of useful information. Good, because, yeah, Google Classroom is powerful. And I think for what we have to do right now, this is a great resource. It'll do everything we need to. And then our next step is just support our district in getting computers out to those kids who don't have one because the equity issue that rings most urgently in my ear is do I want my child with a packet of paper only or with some paperwork and some digital work because we can't do all digital kids have to be active they have to move they have to do things but we can't be all paper so Al, um, yeah. sp speaking of that, um, and I may have missed this again this morning, and I heard you say that is the district working on making sure all these kids are getting yes. the, the links? Because uh, like some of my classes, I've got all but two on my high school, oh. all but one on my junior high. And then from as it, the wow. lower, well, the, I know, right, that's great. The yeah. lower the grades get, the less students I have. Like I only have two in the fourth grade. And, oh. Yeah, yeah. So. I don't know what to do about that. Is there going to be, I know Michelle's working on her. I think, yeah, three through six, I think your best pet is have teachers because we, we have most of our parents on Blooms we can get a hold of. Mm -hmm. So we can get a message from you through us to the parents. That should, I think that's the best way. Okay, so it's just email you guys and, yeah. and let you know my links and everything. And exactly. Okay, my, my uh, passwords. Okay. That's yeah, I think cool. that'll be the easiest way. I sent them home. I also went on Skyward, sent them home in a letter, and I did have trouble. One of my students who's got a sibling, older sibling in another class could not get on. One student can and the other one can't. So Ooh. then I was like, ooh, can they use the same device and do multiple? Oh, yeah. That was a good thought. I, I kind of thought, I wonder if it's because they have the same email or, or, or they're using the same device. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Yeah. And that's it. Troubleshooting is so much easier when they're in your classroom, when they're out there. It's like, right. Yeah. I had a parent email me last night with some issues they were having logging into her son's accounts. And I just kept sending back, try this, try this. Cause I, I, without seeing it, I, I didn't yeah. know. It's crazy. Well, and the, and down at the uh, CCP, I don't think anybody's using it yet. So, yeah, they got their own thing going. Yeah, I'll figure that out. <laughs> they, Thank you. They at least uh, I, I heard Dojo, so Class Dojo. They communicate with their parents that way. So if you get to them what they need to push out, they should be able to push it out. Yeah, uh, I'll do that. I know Heidi said she'd help me with that. Great. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey Al. Yeah. So how are how are we doing? Are we um 
we're at work time uh and i'm only responding to questions because yeah i think the next two hours people need to work with yeah. that because they we've we've learned a lot you've saturated them yeah totally yes. and uh thank you you've been a rock star you've been uh like pro pro, pro zoom um leader here thank you i should tell google hey come on can i skip the test and just give me my certification <laughs> right <laughs> be careful they're gonna want to hire you yeah so see that's we went to a google boot camp um years ago and i didn't want to take the test because you had to agree to give so many trainings. And I was like, wait, at that time, I was like, no, I'm too scared to do that. Um, but yeah, I'm already a Pear Deck coach and a Classcraft ambassador. I'm... All right, you've got enough badges. You don't I got, need I got a couple stuff. of badges, I'm happy. Hey, <laughs> should I go ahead and uh, stop the recording? Yes. Okay.